Hello all you magnificent, magnanimous maltmeisters. And thank you for the malt mention to Michael Fortner introducing, as it does, Ralphie Review 988 Extras. Because Extras isn't a specific quality spirit review. This is more general knowledge. Um, observations I've made, people I've spoken to, stuff that I've learnt over the decades, I'm sharing it with you. Uh, and one thing that I benefit from on this channel is having been around whiskey since the 1980s, which was when I tar started to take it seriously. Um, I'm, look ba I'm looking back now at the amount of change that has taken place relating to and around Scotch whisky, uh, not not just in one specific theme, but on a number of from a number of different directions, and it makes me aware that Scotch whisky uh, will continue to change over the next few years, probably quite dramatically. Uh, and one of the challenges to Scotch whisky is peat uh, is used in some Scotch whiskies. Quite a number of the Isla distilleries, Lagavulin, Laphroaig, Kalila, etc., Bowmore, they are using significant quantities of peat, and yet the environmental lobby is going to be increasingly suggesting that peat does not get used. And in my opinion, this will become an opportunity for the corporate multinational, the large distillery companies who can see ways of uh, cutting costs and introducing peat substitutes into their quote-unquote peated whiskies, which are acceptable to the customer and are going to be accommodated by the customer because it's virtue signalling, green credentials, and we've all got to be responsible for preserving the environment. Um, and, I mean, there's a realistic side to this because a huge amount of peat is burnt every year in the production of Scotch whisky. And not only Scotch whisky, but other whiskies from around the world who are co incorporating peat into the production of their whiskies. France has peated whiskies. Japan has peated whiskies, Australia, Tasmania has peated whiskies, as well as Scotland, and recently, of course, with McCarthy's, we had the arrival of American single malt peated whisky, which worked really, really well, and we're definitely going to see more of this genre, this category, because peatiness is such an overwhelming, distinct flavour which actually transcends flavour into experience. So, although peatiness is a flavour, it's actually more than a flavour. It's more than just a flavour in a whisky. It is, a, it is a hit. It's almost, it works almost the same way as caffeine, in that it provides a sensory shock, which can become quite addictive. And you will find that there are people who are absolutely dedicated to heavily peated whiskies, that when they come to relatively light unpeated whiskies, like Glengoyne, like Arran, they can enjoy them, but they're just not getting what's called the hit, right? Um, it's going to be fascinating to see the emergence of a lot more peated whiskies from around the world, because at least 11% of the world's landmass is covered in peat bogs, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, in the North of the Northern Hemisphere, and in the South of the Southern Hemisphere. So for example, New Zealand has got lots of peat bogs, and these peat bogs are millions of years old, right? and they're incredibly deep, and they're virtually untouched. Now, you might say, well, Ralphie, you know, if you're going to send someone in to start digging up the peat, you know, the damage is damage, however extensive. And I totally get where you're coming from, but there is a way of harvesting peat without damaging the surface, the living crust of the, the peat bogs, which are the very compressed, wet, 
green environments, including bog myrtles and uh, sphagnum moss and other heavily acid tolerant plants and there's not many of these plants that are very acid tolerant because in the decomposition of peat a lot of acidity is created which is why the archaeologists have been so entranced to find these corpses that have been so wonderfully preserved for thousands of years in peat bogs um, for example in Ireland and also in Siberia, where they can literally lift fingerprints off the bodies that are over 5,000 years old. Now, this gives you an idea of what peat bogs are all about. They are a waterlogged, highly acidic, low growth, very stable environment. Um, and in fact, most of the damage to them comes from air pollution, right? rather than from the the excessive mining of them. Of course, it depends where you are, because in Ireland up until recently, there's been a lot of mining of the extent of, extensive peat bogs there, because peat has been fashionable as a soil conditioner that you buy from garden centres. So there's a lot more people shaking packets of, of um, peat as a mulch around their rhododendrons and other other acid loving plants like azaleas for example if you happen to be a gardener you'll know about that um, then the, there are people drinking a glass having had it uh, used as a fuel to dry out uh, germinated barley grain but I think the big companies as they as the greenscape production they will look for cheaper substitutes because it's all about the money. Don't think, don't ever think anything otherwise. And what they'll come across is coconut coir, which can then be flavoured with uh, extracts from oil uh, processing because so many products come from oil anyway. I mean, a lot of pharmaceuticals, most, most pharmaceuticals come from oil. So th th this also creates opportunities, by the way. I mean, you do have a small number of distilleries who do not use peat at all, and they do claim it's for environmental reasons, like Nick Nian Distillery, and I totally respect them for that, but I do feel that they're almost tying one arm behind their, their back, in that if they were creating a peated whisky in which a proportion of the profits went to managing peated grasslands, I think that would be a far, far more positive and proactive thing to do. But that's just my personal opinion. I don't run, run a distillery because, frankly, I don't want the headache of it all. And it's a huge headache, however way you cut it. Um, with peat, we're now at the stage where, having familiarised with Scotch peat, which either comes from the highlands of Scotland or from Isla itself, um, increasingly most of it's coming from the highlands of Scotland you you find that you get this particularly tangy iodine intense zesty style of peatiness but when you move to other parts of Scotland for example if you were in a lowland Scottish peat bog somewhere in the borders or just outside of Glasgow you find that the peat is because it's not by the sea, it's more inland, it's got a lot less salt in it. The salt that's carried in the rain and the air that's blown in from the sea. So you get very salty peat on Isla, for example. But just outside of Glasgow, because you're more inland, it's a bit more, slightly more southern, you, you get something that is more earthy and slightly dusty and less briny. You don't get that sort of saline note that you get from the Isla peat. Um, and again, I'm noticing that here in this Tasmanian whisky that I've just reviewed compared to, say, a standard jobbing Scottish heavily peated malt like this Laphroaig Select, which I don't particularly recommend unless you're making cocktails. Um, you find that what's enjoyable about it is it's tangibly different. 
It's a different flavour of peat, literally, at the point where we think there is only one kind of flavour of peat. And then we can go further and say, well, what else can people use with peat or as an alternative peat? And of course you've got bamboo can be used in China and Japan. Uh, you've got uh, savanna grass could be used in, in Brazil. Uh, sugar cane left over because you don't get peated, you don't get smoky rums, unfortunately. I mean, it would work a treat, but the rum producers don't do it because they don't perceive there's demand for it. But with all this surplus to requirements, shredded sugar cane stem, you could literally take it elsewhere um, and, and burn it, literally, as pellets to kiln barley in, in a, a, a whiskey distillery that's not that far from a rum distillery. And increasingly we're seeing this situation. I mean, it's brought to my attention not that long ago that in fact Brazil is exporting its first whiskey. Yeah, Brazilian whiskey from the Union Distillery. You know, th this is just how extraordinary things are getting. And it's be going to be so interesting to see what India does when there are in fact extensive peat bogs in the foothills of the Himalayas. Because what you need for successful peat bogs is coolness and an undisturbed environment that's relatively flat and waterlogged. Uh, and that's, I mean, Canada and Russia, between the two, have got roughly about 90%, well, 80% of the entire world's peat bogs. So Canadian whiskey could certainly be using um, indigenous peat. Um, and also you've got other, other ingredients you can add to a kiln to generate flavoursome smoke to, to add to the experience of the kilned grain. Uh, and my next review, in fact, review 989, I'm reviewing a particular version of a Swedish whisky from McMurray Distillery where they actually put juniper twigs into the kiln and such is the in in intensity of the resonance coming off these twigs that it does manifest itself into the whisky. And I gotta tell you, I'm so looking forward to reviewing this for you because it tr it's truly fascinating. It's when you taste these alternative whiskies that you see which direction the global spirits industry is going to be going and it's going to become much more diverse as regional whiskies start to develop their regional styles. <coughs> So, for example, in Brazil, they will have um, sugar cane smoked uh, whiskey, uh, and it's going to be fascinating. And they might even say, well, if that works, we may as well um, create a little bit of liquid smoke and mix it in with our rums. And that, by the way, would be a good idea as well. And there's other, other options as well. I mean, there's the Italians, for example, the grappa makers, and I mentioned this, oh, about a year ago, was that when they created smoked grappa, they actually imported Virginia tobacco leaves and they slowly smoked them under the upended barrel so as the barrel wood itself, which was heated, absorbed the smoke and then dispensed it slowly into the whiskey as it was maturing in the cask. So it, it, the smoke in the cask infused itself into the grappa, that's better, as it was maturing in the cask, producing a fantastic result. So, hypothetically speaking, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Not that I intend to skin any of my cats, but um, there's a change going on, a significant change, and I think as part of that change in the global spirits industry, we're going to see more distinctive regional flavours be isolated, highlighted and then more regularly featured. I think it's really exciting. The, it, it brings more drama to our palates when we buy the bottles. But also it can actually 
if we're not careful, if we go in too much and start novelty chasing, uh, we end up just confusing our palates and then we have to take at least a month off just to settle down again. But I'm going to leave you with this. Um, I did an experiment, and I mentioned this a few years ago, but it's worth repeating because it's fascinating. I went round peat bogs in Scotland and I collected samples of peat. I then burnt them um, in my coal fire at home where I lived and collected the ash in a pan, a little, little pan and brush, swept up the ash. And the result, quite simply, let's see if I can, it's the best way of presenting this without dropping them. You will distinctly see how different the colours are. There's the grey one at the end there, then a sandy one, and then an off-white one, and then a kind of slight brick coloured one, and then a yellowish one. Um, and I can tell you exactly where these the, uh, the, the ash came from, which part of Scotland. Uh, <laughs> excuse me a sec. The writing's wearing off on the side of the... Because it's been a few years. Spart, Sart fell. Like, this is actually from the Isle of Man, where I live now. It's grey. The, 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 the peat bogs in the Isle of Man are up in the hills, they're high above sea level, significantly high above sea level, they're fairly shallow um, because there's too much drainage, so they've been slow to build up over the millennia, and also being in the middle of the Irish Sea, were sheltered from the saltiness of Atlantic storms. So it gives you this very dark grey ash, and this is my local peat. Uh, my next sample is from Islay. This is Isla peat. As you can see, it's slight, sort of, almost a kind of magnolia sandy coloured. It's the colour of um, seashore sand. So, I mean, already peat, but totally different colour. And these colours are coming from the mineral content that's left after the combustible part of the peat is gone. So this gives you an idea of how different peat is, depending on where you find it. Now here's some uh, Glasgow peat. This is a peat bog just outside of Glasgow, which is slightly darker shade of the Isle of Peat. And here we've got some peat from Lewis, which is right up the North Outer Hebrides. It's a kind of rich brick colour. Oh, who's mewing? Come in, if you're going to come in, mewing cat. I'm busy. I'm doing a review here. You know? Yes. And I don't have any treats for you, but you can come in. And this is from Arica, which is a peat bog in the middle of Scotland. And as you can see, this colour is really just off-white. It's much nearer to the colour of the Isla peat. So, I think it would be right to presume that Swedish peat is going to be different again. Canadian peat will be different because parts of Canada, most of Canada, are thousands of miles away from coastline. And as a result of which, you're going to get very low salt content peat. So it's going to be a very creamy peat, an almost uh, aromatic peat. Uh, in India, uh, it would not, I mean, would not surprise me, again, you're thousands of miles from the ocean, that you've got some very deep peat bogs uh, and they get the flavour of the peat when it's used in, in peating whiskies or any other spirits is, is going to have its own particular flavour. So it really depends now which, which way the wind was the wind going to blow is are some countries going to go ahead and use their peat for peated whiskies when rules and regulations coming out of the deep state say, oh no, environmental reasons, you can't do this, can't do this, can't do whatever, can't do anything. Um, you've got to use, you know, wood chips, right? Uh, recycled wood chips. And by the way, you've got to have all sorts of licenses because you're emitting smoke for your carbon emissions. And we're going to charge you extra taxes because of your, you're degreening your operation. Uh, all this is 
literally kicking off right now. And I think we're going to see some distilleries who anticipate that if they keep using peat, they can add it as a premium into the price of their product to offset the additional taxes they'll have to be, the carbon taxes. And the result is that they, they will have a higher reputation because they're sticking more to traditions. But I also suspect that some distillery will find something recyclable from somewhere and use that for kilning their barley and have tremendous success with it and get a very satisfactory result. Time, malt mates, will tell. Well, I hope you found this interesting. I'm really just kind of riffing a little bit here about peat in whiskies because the way it's always been is not the way it's going to continue. And it's exciting times actually. I view the future of whiskey very positively. And also one of the positive things is so many more people are actually drinking responsibly and taking a genuine interest in the provenance and uh, a marketing free genuine story uh, and message that relates to specific distilleries. And, and this is a good thing. I think more and more distilleries are going to be like Springbank, which I think would is a sort of distillery that's prepared to pay the carbon tax to keep producing something that's traditional. And I think it's the big corporations that will have major financial advantage from finding peat alternatives. And to be honest with the the, the customer base or the consumer base that they are gearing their more mass produced products to, um, that they won't particularly be bothered any which way. So they'll be quite happy to accept the product. And that's the way it goes. And it all goes on, mates. All goes on. And it's accompanied by quality, juicy, single malt whiskey and other quality spirits. You know. Phew. Isn't life wonderful? You know, sometimes you just got to switch off all the bad news. All that constant buzzing drone white noise. We know it's there, we know it's a bad world, but sometimes you just got to take that button and go click, just click. You only have to do it once and just shut everything off and leave your phone out in the garage where, so that nobody can hear you. And your thoughts and your conversations are your own and with your friends and with your family and with your mock moments. Cheers. Mm. Lovely. See you soon, mock mates.